Let's call our first panel to the stage, please. Come on up, everybody. Uh, I'll, I'll introduce our moderator, then let him circle through his panelists. Most of you in the room know Commissioner Mike Florio. Mike has been an icon in our industry for a long time. Been a commissioner at the PUC now for five years. Uh, and in the past, he was a board member at the ISO. He's held a number of significant positions and is certainly one of the most influential thought leaders we have in our industry. So with that, please welcome this panel on regionalism through the lens of utility leaders. Good morning, everyone. We've got an illustrious panel here today, so uh, uh, I won't give all their backgrounds or it would take most of the time we've got uh, available. We've got Doug Hunter from UAMPS, the Utah Association of... Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Pat Hogan from PG&E, Lisa Grow from uh, Idaho Power, Maria Pope from Portland General, Elliot Mainzer from BPA, and Mark Schiavone from APS. Uh, like to give everybody just a minute or two for uh, opening remarks. Uh, why don't we start with Elliot? Uh, can you uh, share with us your perspective? Well, thank you very much, Commissioner. Good morning, everybody. It's a real pleasure to be here. I've, I've uh, been to a number of the symposiums. It's been great to watch the growth and uh, really exciting to be here. Of course, we're, um, I think, a familiar entity to many folks in the room at BPA, but not, not everybody here. So just briefly, um, Bonneville, of course, we're based out of Portland. Uh, we're the Federal Power Marketing Administration, part of the Department of Energy that has the responsibility for marketing uh, the output of the Federal Columbia River Power System. Uh, we're a big grid operator, about 15,300 <clears throat> miles of transmission, and we're very, very woven in uh, to the Western Interconnection. We sort of stitch together the, the, northern, the northern and southern parts of uh, Pacific Northwest. We also have big interconnections with Pacific Core and the Rocky Mountain Utilities. So we're just very, very, very um, engaged uh, in the Western uh, conversation. We also have a lot of customers who are embedded uh, into the utility systems of, uh, especially Pacific Core, the utilities that are currently uh, members of the energy imbalance market and potentially uh, PTO participants. And so the, the, the developments that are happening in the West, the energy imbalance market, are, are of very significant interest to us. We've been participating very actively uh, with Pacific Core and the California ISO since the inception of the energy imbalance market, uh, helping with some of the technical issues associated with getting those participants into the market. And generally that's been a, a very constructive conversation, obviously, um, as an is a uh, power marketing administration, federal entity. Um, our customers, our congressional delegation, always very, very interested in sort of preserving and enhancing uh, the value of that system. And we've wanted to very much stay engaged in the conversation. We've appreciated uh, folks here in California and the West uh, creating space for us at the table for the conversation. And it's just wonderful to be here today and uh, part of the dialogue. So thank you. Mark? Yes, good morning. Uh, also glad to be here this morning. Uh, regionalization in this conversation and topic uh, we find very interesting for many reasons, but as we thought about it and as I think about it, uh, we, we've been in this for a long, long time together in the West, whether it's joint ownership of transmission, joint ownership of power plants to wholesale markets. We've had forms of solving problems to regionalization for many, many decades, so it's not a new concept. I think as we look forward into the future, it's how that concept evolves and how do we change the way we do business collectively and what's in the best interest of our customers. Obviously in Arizona one of our, our major challenges has been uh, we started down a path in the late 90s and as a result of some challenges uh, we backed away from uh, opening up the markets if you will for ourselves and that has been a tremendous hurdle as time has evolved that has become lessened and I appreciate some of the earlier comments as far as cooperation, trust, working together, it is a practical reality that the world is changing in front of us and we have to look for solutions uh, as we go forward. We joined the energy imbalance market uh, one October, uh, so another three weeks uh, we'll go live in the energy imbalance market, and that's a big step for us, uh, for our regulators. Um, 
And it's important that the trust that's built up as a result of enter, uh, entering into this market is realized first and foremost for our customers. So we look forward to the opportunity to continue dialogue around what do we do in the future as a region. Good morning. Thanks for the invite. So Idaho Power, um, you know, we just turned 100 years old this year, so we're really proud of that. We are predominantly hydro-based, a little over 50% of our generation comes from hydro in a, in a good water year. And so we have a very flexible system, it's very diverse, and, and really our interest in EIM, you know, just full disclosure, I'm an electrical engineer, because it, it, so it really became an engineering problem for us. We were uh, blessed with, bestowed upon about 1,000 megawatts of PERPA that uh, we were having a hard time integrating on top of a 3,400 megawatt peak in the summer. And, and so we were sort of out of our, the ability of our system to integrate that. So we had a real problem that needed to be solved. The other thing is if you look up at the map, we are located in southern Idaho. We have 11 uh, transmission lines that connect to neighboring states, nine of which connect to a, a participant, um, either Nevada Energy or Pacific Core Energy or one of their, one of their um, uh, other entities, Rocky Mountain and, and Pacific Core. So it was really a compelling story, if you will, when we looked at what problems we were trying to solve, either you know, spend 10 million to join or 300 million to build a flexible resource to try and integrate these resources. Um, and so it really came down to a simple uh, math problem in a lot of ways. Certainly Idaho is a very conservative state. Even though we don't have an RPS, we, um, our, our annual um, portfolio is as green as any of, of you that do have them. And, and some, often we, we exceed the, the current goals, not the 50%, but in the high 30s anyway. So, so it isn't just because we are in Idaho, we do care about the planet. Uh, we don't have as many people to, to have to deal with and, and some of the problems that come with what you have down here. So you know, we're certainly open for business. If any of you want to have good, clean living, come to Idaho. <laughs> So anyway, we welcome the conversation, and that we do think, you know, when you really just think about it in the, in the basic engineering terms, the grid as we know it in the West, and I would argue in the entire United States, really is the engineering marvel of the 20th century. It, it's something that we see every day, we interact with every day, and we really don't think about it like that. And the, to the extent that we can all benefit from the diversity that exists inside that system, inside that machine, so that we aren't all trying to solve our own problems by ourselves, that is a big deal. It is a huge cost savings, I think, to everybody. I think there's benefit for everybody. And so we're excited to join. We're not, we're not scheduled to join until 18. We're still waiting for regulatory approval, but we're very optimistic and we look forward to, to our partnership. Good morning. Uh, Maria Pope and I'm from Portland General Electric. Uh, like Lisa, we're a vertically integrated uh, regulated utility. We serve about 850,000 customers, or about half the state of Oregon's population, and about three quarters of the industrial and commercial uh, enterprises in the state. Uh, we also generate about 4,000 megawatts. Uh, about 25% of that comes from hydro. 15% of that is relatively new and comes from wind. And then the balance is from coal and from natural gas. Uh, Steve mentioned uh, some groundbreaking legislation that was passed just this past year uh, by, uh, with, by work by Portland General as well as Pacific Corps uh, and many others in the renewable community uh, as well as other stakeholders and parties. And we will be moving towards 50% renewables by 2040 and also ceasing all coal-fired uh, supply for our customers in the state of Oregon. Um, we, uh, that is a big hurdle. Uh, it will take a lot of uh, time and effort, and we currently are already integrating quite a bit of, of renewables in our system. We've been working with California for decades. Uh, we're active in the markets here on a day ahead and real-time basis. We also have several long-term contracts uh, with public entities in both Northern and Southern California, um, and own just under 20% of the California-Oregon intertie. Uh, as a result, uh, we use about 55% of that capacity to serve our own needs. Uh, we have been working uh, very collaboratively with parties in the Pacific Northwest uh, and also uh, with the CAISO. Uh, we expect to join uh, the Western EIM October uh, next year um, and see it as an integral way for us to cost effectively integrate the renewables that we'll be bringing onto our system. 
Good morning, and a uh, real pleasure to be here as well, and uh, very honored to uh, be up here with, the, with my distinguished colleagues. Um, Pat Hogan, um, I'm responsible for the electric transmission and distribution business for PG&E, serving 16 million people in Northern and Central California. Um, as a California utility, um, we are at the forefront of, of the changes that are happening in our industry um, and our transition to a clean energy economy. Um, we are very supportive and highly engaged in, in promoting the Western regionalization. Um, mentioned earlier about the benefits we've already seen from um, the EIM market. Um, we see those continuing um, and, and a broader regionalization, um, I think, brings huge benefits to really everybody in the West. Um, and selfishly looking at um, our customers, bringing benefits to our customers as well. So um, we looking forward to hearing the comments from the rest of our panelists today. Good morning. Thank you, Commissioner. Thank you, uh, fellow panelists. This is, uh, I'm the sort of odd man out here representing Utah Associated Municipal Power Systems, UAMPS. Uh, for those that you're not familiar with us, uh, we have 45 different members in seven western states. So I think we're the definition of regionalism in a way. Uh, there, We do not require our members to buy from us. We're not an all-power requirement supplier. We're a project-based uh, entity. 37 of our members sit within the Pacific Corp BA, so you can see we're right in the gun site here of uh, EIM as well as uh, regionalization. And then two other of our members are in NV's uh, BA with uh, EIM coming through there. And, and so uh, UAMPS has also been a supporter of regionalization for years. I just want to make sure it's gone through all the way clear back to the Pacific Power and Light and Utah Power and Light merger. Uh, our emphasis in that case <clears throat> was to open up the transmission system for transmission dependent utilities, if you will, which we were successful in our fight with Idaho Power, our partner Idaho Power in that, uh, to open up that transmission system, which has been a benefit, I think, to everybody in the West, definitely uh, public power. We've been members of TransWest, Indigo, we've participated in uh, all the current uh, regionalization efforts, and uh, we're optimistically uh, looking towards uh, the EIM and regionalization expansion. Uh, Elliot, uh, could you talk a little bit about SEAMS issues? Uh, how is it working with the EIM now functioning with Pacific Core and the interaction with the Bonneville system? Yeah, I think very, very early uh, in the decision-making process when Pacific Corps announced uh, moving into the EIM, it became very clear that they were going to be uh, needing access uh, to our transmission system to be able to get in there and that there were going to be a number of really, I think, pretty complicated technical issues that we need to sort out for those of you that deal with these issues. How do you manage system operating limits on our grid? How do you get visibility into the dispatch of power plants that are embedded in our system? How do you make sure that you have the right data transfer protocols? How do you make sure that exist, use of existing transmission rights doesn't violate tariff provisions. And so we sat down real early and we, we kind of actually sort of hammered out a memorandum of agreement and, and some, a set of principles. Obviously, as the operator of the federal grid, we wanted to make sure that we did, didn't have any unintended reliability or commercial consequences on our system. We also wanted to be constructively engaged and make sure that the market would function effectively. And I think that uh, through a lot of diligence and uh, a lot of weekly telephone calls, uh, at the high levels of the organization, we've been able to actually hammer that out. We're actually in the process right now of formalizing an actual coordinated transmission agreement that will actually memorialize uh, the technical work that we did so that as future EIM participants who may have dependencies on our grid and on the ISO side uh, come in, we'll have standardized procedures. So I would say that so far, uh, it's worked effectively. Obviously, as you start thinking about uh, the PTO and the broader regionalization of the ISO, that raises a whole nother set of big issues, not all of which I think we've completely sorted out, but managing at those seams, uh, staying communicative, making sure that you really have reliability um, and visibility, and, and making sure that the physics, the economics, and, and the politics are all sorted out effectively uh, really matters. So, so far, the experience with the EIM has gone well. We've been pleased to see also uh, the representatives now the governing board there. Um, I think it's a good, good group. Um, and I think so far it's, it's worked effectively, and we look forward to the next generation. Is it ever in the cards for Bonneville to join, or would that take an act of Congress? <laughs> you know, put it this way, I mean, we, we've, we've talked already, <clears throat> excuse me, this morning about, um, you know, we're very fortunate uh, to be sitting on some very, very valuable uh, zero carbon resources in the Pacific Northwest, right? I mean, that federal hydro system is an amazing machine. Obviously, our preference customers 
are first in line uh, for the output of that system. And serving their needs really uh, always is my uh, predominant interest. But to the extent to which uh, we continue to have surplus capability, uh, being able to make that capacity available, get compensated for it, monetize and provide zero carbon flexibility and ramping to deal with, you know, as ISO talks about capability needs, tr tracking that ramp, uh, managing oversupply. Uh, we have seen the Scandinavian experience. I think that hydro system up there in, in, in Norway has done a pretty amazing job positioning itself to provide storage and flexibility capability. That's an almost perfect analog uh, to what we have going down here in the West where the sort of the California continentals are decarbonizing. So we've seen that experience. Uh, we are certainly uh, setting ourselves up to position and take advantage of that. Whether we will eventually join the EIM, I think, is a, is a question of how well the, the governance continues to function and whether uh, we continue to see other public power entities have a good experience in that market. So we're going to keep, it, keep an eye on it and build our system out and, and maintain optionality. But at this point, uh, we, no decision on that. <laughs> uh, Mark, you're uh, on the verge of uh, starting participation in the EIM. Can you... Describe for us uh, what the process has been like. Uh, what have been the pitfalls, the surprises, the challenges? Being lucky enough to go after Pacific Core and NV Energy uh, obviously was a benefit because many lessons were learned both by California ISO as well as those two uh, companies and being able to tap into that knowledge base to better understand the implications of uh, what we were embarking on. Um, but what we didn't have full knowledge or full insight into is the real impact organizationally for vertically integrated utility uh, to function inside of a marketplace like this, into our uh, marketplace. And that surprised us, and it caught us a little bit uh, off guard, if you will. The technology, you, you can always find solutions for. Those are the easy parts of the challenges. Uh, you know, for example, metering and so on. You know, there was a listing of metering, but our metering wasn't the same metering as listed. But we found it was compatible. We didn't have to make change outs and able to move forward. Um, what we weren't ready for was the implication for our transmission operators, as an example. Uh, their mindsets, <coughs> excuse me, their mindsets on how they operated it had to really be transformed. Um, they had to build some confidence and trust, and they're still in that process, obviously, as we go live in a few weeks, uh, that the marketplace will work and will really aid in reliability, and that, for them, after years of operating in a certain manner, is a challenge. Uh, we have a workforce of about 6,500 people in APS, and close to 10% of our workforce is impacted by EIM. So the amount of training, the amount of new qualifications you had to run through, the new processes you had to develop. Again, you, you know it on the surface when you sit back and you talk to people, but when you really get into it and get into the meat of what that looks like, that's a very, very significant challenge for an organization in a very short period of time. Uh, again, you know, uh, Cal ISO was a significant help in helping us through a lot of those challenges and hurdles and working through our training programs to get where we needed to be. Uh, but that was something that caught us by surprise. And I think the last piece for us has been the back office work and the implications in the back office. Uh, that, and it continues to be a challenge, and uh, that was something, again, that we weren't necessarily, I won't say prepared for, but didn't understand uh, the impacts of some of the changes in accounting and what we were gonna be looking at as we went forward in settlement. That, that was a pretty significant challenge for our organization that we've been working through. So those are probably the three things. Uh, let me put Doug on the spot for a minute. Uh, uh, I believe your organization uh, initially protested Pacificor's uh, uh, actions in joining the ISO. What were you worried about then and has it come to pass? Uh, well, that's correct. Uh, you know, it, it came 
it, it moved very quickly, if you will, and so we weren't sure that we had all the data and all the facts down associated how it would impact us. Uh, we made a decision at the beginning not to join the EIM, but I can say we've reconsidered that and most likely will be joining the EIM here in, in the, the short future thing. Uh, obviously, just the growing pains and sitting in terms of uh, dealing in, we don't have the same uh, basis of renewables that everybody else seems to do. So the integration problem wasn't there for us, if you will, as much as going. But let me say this, in terms of what uh, we've, uh, it's a steep learning curve, but we've learned that we have a marketplace now. We really do see it as a marketplace uh, that we can enter and it would be beneficial for our customers to participate in that. Uh, we're, as Ellie said, we're interested in the governance and making sure the governance works. It seems it will now. And I think this time, you know, Mike, is what's uh, satisfied us uh, that uh, this isn't as dire as we thought it might be when it first started. Okay. Now, you're, m most of your members are embedded in the Pacific Core yeah. Balancing Authority, mm -hmm. but it's, is it up to each individual entity whether they're going to trade in the EIM? Well, they could uh, independently if they want, uh, desire to do that, but given the nature of the transmission agreements and their relationship with uh, Pacific Corp, it would be uh, expensive for them to do it. So we anticipate mm -hmm. that they would, we would funnel through uh, okay. our group uh, individually. Mm -hmm. Okay, but you haven't up to this point. No, we haven't, but uh, as I just said, we just finished up uh, just a week ago a very in-depth study mm -hmm. on the impacts of EIM and the uh, benefits it could bring to our gas fire generation that's sitting in Utah as well as our behind the meter generation. And then we actually have joint ownership with uh, Pacific Corp and Coal Plant along with Deseret Generation and Transmission Cooperative who uh, we're very interested in uh, working those joint ownership bus yeah. arrangements out inside the EIM. We see it as a, a, a potential benefit for all. Great. Uh, Maria, you've got uh, a year to go. Uh, how is it going so far and what, what challenges and opportunities are you seeing? Uh, sir, uh, we began our process actually uh, quite a while ago. Uh, we um, uh, expected to see a lot of change management issues because we had a long ways to go in terms of our internal technology and our integration between our generation plants uh, all the way through our merchant operations to our balancing authority and then other areas. Um, that being said, uh, sitting where we are today, well, we feel well positioned for October of next year and very fortunate to be following not only Pacific Core and NV Energy, but uh, I think more importantly, uh, Arizona, uh, as well as Puget Sound. Uh, we feel as if we're, we're well positioned. Uh, we started actually really looking at our generation fleet, uh, making sure that we, as we increase the cycling and integrated renewables, which we were finding increasingly challenging as we move to 15% wind, um, that we needed to start with the technical aspects and make sure that we protected our customers' assets uh, and ran those uh, units for the long term. Uh, we also had the opportunity to learn uh, from many in California, and in particular from PG&E, around how they operated their hydro fleet and really understand from that perspective. I would agree um, with what Mark has said with regards to the people change aspects. This is very new to many people in our organization. Um, and while the technology pieces change every way people look at how they do their work, they also have an impact on how they value their contributions to the company and to the region. And I think that that internal piece uh, for how we make sure that they see value in what they're delivering uh, to our 850,000 customers um, continues to be really important as we move uh, into this next year and implementation. We also view that uh, we will continue to evolve through 2018, so we don't see this as a process that starts and stops with October of next year. As we move to 50% renewables, it's gonna take uh, every piece of uh, brain power and collaboration with our regional partners to be able to get there. Pat, PG&E has been a legacy member of the ISO. Uh, how has the startup of the EIM uh, impacted your company? And uh, any concerns, or is it all good? How's it going? 
So <clears throat> I think as a legacy member, we had an advantage that my colleagues didn't have here, um, having already um, been a part and, and, and participating. Um, so for us, it really was about um, a couple of key things. Um, really making sure that the system was ready, the IT infrastructure, um, the modeling, and uh, um, you know, just being really careful about the market design and making sure that it's going to work out of the gate and that uh, that um, our customers weren't going to get uh, get hurt. Um, we, you know, we're obviously a huge supporter, as I said earlier, and knowing that you know, in this space, really bigger is better, and and so the the more folks that uh, that join the EIM and ultimately uh, the wide, wider regionalization, we, we just know is going to be better for, um, for everyone. Um, a key aspect for us as well in the transition was the governance. Um, so I think two key, two key success factors what, um, was the, the quick establishment of a, a transition committee. I think that really helped get a lot of the issues on the table. Um, and then an independent governance body, um, I think, was really helpful in, in the establishment and really making sure that uh, um, independent folks are hearing the voices of, of folks and, uh, and, and making sure that the market was going to work for, for everybody. Lisa, does any of this make you nervous with your <laughs> entry uh, still a little farther off in the future? Well, I think I would be crazy if I didn't, you know, if we weren't a little terrified, but it's, um, you know, we, actually everybody that has been a participant thus far has been incredibly gracious in helping us along. And, and we saw the studies too. It brings great value to the entire region for us joining. Um, so I'm sure there's no small part of that in the, in the help to get there. But, um, you know, we feel like we're really well equipped. I've got an absolutely fantastic team working on it. We've got a, a lot of really bright people. Um, that are that are getting ready to go but i also know that it's just quite honestly it's always messy in the middle there there's always going to be things that we didn't think of or that come up later and and you know we're kind of a scrappy bunch uh, we, we 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 will All that clean living that's right it's that <laughs> clean living so uh you know we'll roll with it and uh and we will we'll figure it out as we go but again we're we're very optimistic in in what the result's going to be and so we'll continue this progression and like maria we we see it as a, it's a step on a trajectory and and so it's an important step and and we want to get it right and and want to see the value as soon as we can for for our customers now the, the headline numbers that people always see are the gross benefits. And there are plenty of doubters who say, well, yeah, that's gross benefits, but what about the costs? Has anyone seen grounds for concern that the benefits won't vastly exceed the costs in this? Certainly our studies have shown it's a modest benefit. This is not anything that's really going to radically change our business. Again, it's more about what we avoid in the future than the, the necessarily the, 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 you know, it's a decent benefit, so there is a net benefit. And, and if it weren't, uh, I don't think we could sell it to our regulators. Uh, so we took a very conservative view, so I think we probably will see maybe more benefit um, than we are predicting at the moment. But that's also, we want to walk before we run on that too. Uh, let me just address a little bit of, on that point. Um, all of us look at our costs a little bit differently because we're starting from uh, different systems. We're starting from different levels of integration within our systems. Elliot talked about uh, the visibility planning, um, technological uh, communication systems we all have. We're all a little bit different. Uh, my sense is, is that uh, irrespective even of the market benefits of participating in a broader footprint, uh, many of those technologies and advancements that we are making and many others are making uh, across the country have value in and of themselves. Yeah, I, I'd just like to point out in terms of the costs, obviously the settlements inside of the EIM market are the most difficult to, uh, aspect to get our arms around. So. Uh, but we believe that that differential of cost will be overweighed by the benefits that we just have been looking at studying. So it's, uh, as I was talking to Elliot earlier, it's a mechanical problem, not a philosophical problem on these settlements, but it's still unclear as to the full benefit. Yeah, Mark. Yeah, I was just going to add on to what Maria said, and I would agree that if the benefits go beyond the dollars and cents. Because as we talk about regionaliz regionalism and continuing to evolve, uh, you're going to start someplace with people, and you're going to have to educate, train, 
modify behaviors, think about the world differently. So to me, as, as it was already stated, this is a stepping stone and a logical step, whether it's today or in the future, you're still gonna have to make it. So it's a great opportunity to start moving things forward. Mike, the only thing I'd add, of course, we're not in the energy imbalance market, but I would, I've, I've watched both uh, Lisa and Maria uh, kind of getting ahead of the curve with their utilities on this. I remember, Lisa, when you started uh, working with the network model, the peak, et cetera. And I think for, for utilities that are maybe not necessarily right now uh, thinking about about EIM, uh, this, the state awareness requirements, the interchange requirements, the data transfer, the dynamic transfer issues, um, the cultural issues are massive. But just beginning now to examine your internal, your, 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 your entire commercial operational drivetrain for your utility and just understanding what those technological requirements are for these new markets and what it actually takes to plug and play with demand response resources, what it takes to, to take advantage of synchro phasers into your dispatch. Those questions, you can never really start early enough to anticipate them uh, because they're going to pay off benefits no matter what, no matter whether you're market integrated or not, but the, the requirements of the modern utility are really requiring a, a dramatic technological transformation and starting early, I think makes sense. We're certainly doing it at BPA. I think the only thing I would add is I, I think there's also some reliability benefits that we'll, we'll gain from being part of this as well. We mentioned earlier just even the ramp rate and you know being able to meet that ramp rate is uh, clearly a cost component, but there's also a pretty big reliability component to that. Great. Uh, it seems like most of the challenges with the EIM are technical you know, systems, people. Have any of you experienced any, using the term broadly, political issues around participation in the EIM or has, has it been kind of quiet on that front? Early on, the very first uh, opportunity we had to talk with our commission about it, there was a lot of pes uh, pessimism in regards to EIM, and Steve and I spent some time with our uh, commissioners to educate, and uh, I think Steve eloquently put that it's not the gateway drug to something uh, <laughs> broader, and uh, that resonated with some of our regulators. But uh, we had opposition from our regulatory uh, body, and. Uh, that's evolved, and I think their, their better understanding of the benefits of EIM for our customers specifically and what that can bring to the, in the future. So early on, a lot of resistance, as I described, but I think over time, and once they see the real benefits, I think that'll uh, be eliminated. Yeah, I'd, uh, I think in terms of just uh, the concept of exporting California policy into the West was probably the most difficult concept in the Intermountain area anyway, and obviously with the potential expansions even more pronounced, if you will. Uh, but I think we've been able to talk to the political leaders in terms of the potential benefits associated uh, specifically with EIM. Now, obviously, that we'll just have to see how that, that moves forward. But I think that's the reluctance on the, on the part of the politicians, if you will. Well, why don't we turn to the broader regionalization discussion then. Uh, my observation has been as relatively quiet as EIM has been on the political front. The uh, full membership in, in the ISO seems to be a hot potato for everyone. Uh, uh, with the exception of Pat, nobody here is you know, uh, a full member now. Uh, Doug may get dragged in, I guess, along with Pacific Uh What are people's thoughts about, is, is it too much too fast to be talking about a Western ISO, or, you know, is it a logical progression? How, do, how does it look from your standpoints? Well, I'd jump in on that. Uh, I think uh, our, our largest concern right now would be the way the overheads and the cost of the ISO are going to be spread. We understand the value of reducing to the California 
ISO participants of having their overheads diluted by other kilowatt hours in the West. What we'd be more interested in and we're, we're trying to focus on is, is there a better way to actually run the ISO, if you will, mm -hmm. to make it more cost effective across all these additional kilowatt hours so there could be uh, some real savings. Uh, just to give you just a general concept, basically we could quadruple our transmission access charge by an expansion uh, in Utah. That, we just don't see that associated benefit whatsoever, to be honest with you. And then I'll just finish up on this. Uh, I understand the need to move forward on maybe, you know, with just Pacific Corps, but really if the benefit's there, it's got to be across the West is the way we see it. And so we would like to see, we're, actually we were encouraged that California slowed down just a little bit on this thing so that we can maybe get a, a more handle on that. We see having a flow based regionalized across the whole WCC as a much better benefit than just the Pacific Corp footprint. So I, I definitely don't think it's too early to be talking about it, um, but we definitely need to monitor the speed at which we, we think we can, can implement. I, um, building on some of the things that, that Doug said. Uh, um, we, we can't let speed be the enemy of good here. We gotta make sure it, it is much more complicated than the EIM. Um, but I think also has much greater benefits, and, and it, so it is about getting it right. Um, clearly at the top of that list is, is around governance, and I, I think we can learn from the, from the EIM in terms of what's a, what's a good governance model. I think we also have other multi-state ISOs out there that, that we can learn from, and I, I think having, having an independent board is a, is a really big part of that. Um, and then in just thinking about um, how we're, how we're going to go about this, setting up a transition committee as, as soon as possible. Um, we're a huge proponent of that. We just think it makes a lot of sense getting the right people in the room um, and really thinking through what the transition issues are. And then just making sure that uh, we really are ready to go before we pull the trigger. I think it's important that we don't underappreciate where we currently are. Uh, while five states have joined uh, the Western EIM so far, and uh, obviously Washington and Arizona will be next, um, right now that represents essentially um, one ownership structure, one decision-making body from that standpoint. Uh, there's a lot of work to be done as the rest of us uh, also join, and we've already seen just in the two years of evolution a number of important changes. Um, the EIM is also extremely well constructed uh, from an ease of joining standpoint because it's completely voluntary and that means also voluntary to get out. Um, so there's very low uh, issues uh, for regulators and politicians uh, to have to address uh, any broader discussion or significant changes as to the way um, the EIM is constructed would toss all of those things back up into the air. And my fear is, is that would take place before we really have begun to see uh, what we would expect to be much more significant savings than the 88 million uh, earned to date uh, as we expand through the West. Uh, that number should be very large, and I would hate to jeopardize uh, the good and the progress made to date uh, for jumping too soon into questions that add additional complexity with potentially not a lot of marginal benefits. That certainly is one of the issues we had uh, have to overcome, even with the EIM, although because of what Maria just stated, easy to get in, easy to get out, relatively low cost to, to join, um, there still is a long memory in Idaho from 2000 and, and what happened here. And there's, there isn't, there's concern about, I think equally, California is worried about our, our ideology getting in here. You know, we're equally concerned of some of the goals here, which we don't want to interfere with your pursuit of your goals, but we don't necessarily share them. And so we're watching carefully. I think Marie and I both would say we're happy to let our friends from Pacific Corps go first and do all the hard stuff, and we'll come in later and say if, if, it, if it shows benefit. And I think, though, I will say in my 29 years with Idaho Power, I have been a part of every single effort um, to regionalize uh, some sort of, you know, I'm Indigo and RTO West and Grid West, and I forget all the Wests we had. But we, we've certainly made a lot of attempts at it. And so I do think there is a market that's sort of been crying out to be created for a long time. But how we do it and when we do it is still very much up in the air. So we'll watch carefully and we certainly are rooting for all of you and I think we can get all of our, um, I think we can all pursue our goals and not necessarily have to overwhelm um, people with, with what we believe and we can still you know, all get benefit out of it and, and continue uh, to work together. I agree with Lisa. 
let someone else go first and see how it works. Uh, I think that's always a good position to be in. Uh, you know, it's interesting, you know, Steve's plea uh, about the future and the benefit to all, uh, especially when you look at environmental benefit, customer benefits that come from uh, a more broad regionalism, uh, regionalization of the, the, the grid. I don't think anybody disputes that, that there's got to be value in that. Um, I think the question comes in policy and policy makers and in each individual state, the autonomy that each individual state's had to this point in time. And, you know, the elephant in the room has always been, is California going to control my state? And we're not going to allow that to happen. And I think those hurdles are real. I think they have to be overcome. And I think uh, whatever, you know, using the greenhouse gas as an example, greenhouse gas standards are in place in this state, how it impacts the states surrounding you as a result. And those are real issues. And those are the things, until, they're, until there's dialogue and conversation that goes beyond California, centric, and makes it a broader conversation, I, I just don't see movement anytime in the near future to move towards that broader market view. Uh, there's still a lot of uh, people that have very long memories, and, and that's a real concern. And I think as California is having the internal conversations without bringing those other potential stakeholders in, I think it's going to continue to be a challenge uh, to move this forward. I think these are some very thoughtful comments, I guess. <coughs> Sorry about that. Um, my, you know, it's interesting watching, um, watching market design issues evolve over the last you know, 10, 15 years I've been in the industry. I've, I've come to sort of use this kind of simple heuristic way of thinking about it. I sort of think about the, the physics, the economics, and the politics of markets. You heard me mention that before. And they're, they're very interwoven with each other. I think, you know, the, the physics... Of, of spreading volatility and uncertainty and taking advantage of load resource variability and diversity across a broader footprint. You know, those, are, those are laws of physics. They're, you know, they're not that contestable. And I think that through power pooling and reserve sharing and, and even some of the dynamics we're seeing today in the energy imbalance market, and, and I think one of, the, one of the things that would be most interesting to the EIM is watching the flex reserve requirements of these utilities diminish over time. That's sort of a a benefit we don't talk about enough from my perspective is a real part of the value proposition. I think you're going to see the physics play out. And then, of course, the economics are really, really, really important. And we've learned the hard way, I think, not just here, but in other parts of the world as well, you know, that the price signals and the behavior that you incent are so incredibly important. And if you don't think that through, you know, bad market design can be a really big problem. So you've, it's so important to get market design right and be thoughtful about that. And I think that the region has, has, has come quite a ways, and we've certainly recognized the importance of resource adequacy uh, and sufficiency in good market design. You do not want to open up your new markets into scarcity. That is such a recipe for disaster, right? So that's something I think we've learned as a region. But the politics, which, you know, sort of another word for governance, are really, at the end of the day, kind of the hardest part because, you know, everybody has their, their realm of decision-making and local control, and that's just a very, very, very important area for everybody with public power, public utility commissioners, ISOs, FERC, you name it. So we all, so the gov so getting the governance right is so incredibly important to build that trust because power pooling and sharing diversity requires trust. It requires the sense that your partner is going to be there. They're going to show up. They're not going to lean on you. And so there's dependencies between the politics and the physics and the economics. And actually, one of the things I think that I think we really need to watch out for is we have, as the West has the broader conversation. So we're sitting up there as a federal system. You know, very we have a very strong vested interest in this getting done right just because of the potential negative consequences on our 15,000 miles of grid and our power system, right? But I think you, there's an interplay between, between the governance and the physics and the economics in that, in that you have to be willing to trust each other enough to actually share and chase the optimization. You have to be willing to, sh you have to, be willing to pool uh, peaking requirements and pool flex reserves. And if you can't get beyond the trust boundary of the governance, to actually chase the optimization, you're gonna leave real value on the table and you're likely to get the market design wrong. And so I think those are some long-term lessons that we've learned and we need to really keep them, uh, I think, in the front of our minds. Uh, trust is a word I hear a lot in the discussions about possible regionalization. Uh, what can be done to help build that? Or is it just inherent in kind of 
take the small step with EIM. I mean, certainly gatherings like this where people get to know each other, I think helps build that trust. But, uh, you know, is there, are there some do's and don'ts that we need to keep in mind as people grapple with this and try to get comfortable working together? Uh, well, uh, I'd like to point out, though, I think on the trust, I think that's right, uh, Mike, is that uh, there is a concern, as I've pointed out, especially with those that are not familiar with the workings of the utility system on what's happening here. But in the West, uh, at least UAMP sees this, uh, that we're lucky because uh, right now we have a proposal in the uh, Mountain West transmission group to the east of us that will allow us to do a comparative uh, approach. And I think competition, if you will, and watching somebody else develop this will allow us to develop that. Obviously, the governance is important in, in, in no matter which of the um, ISOs that you were going to be looking at, but having that one competitive backdrop will keep it, I think, on a more honest basis, not that it would be dishonest, just that it just gives us that comparative value. Speaking from inside California, if I was outside California, I'd want to see California say that they're willing to give up some control, right? And, and, and uh, uh, truly allow um, an independent operation of a, of a broader ISO. Um, that's what I would be looking for. Yeah, I think Pat was very succinct. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Uh, Doug, could you talk a little bit more about what's happening with the Mountain West? Uh, I think it's kind of evolving in real time. Uh, yeah, uh, I think uh, most people are familiar with the fact that they've, uh, you know, put together their memorandum of agreement uh, to, and have uh, actually supplied money into a budgetary process uh, to uh, move through. They've developed their license plate rates. They've developed their once-through rate. Uh, that sort of, uh, they're, they've got an RF uh, a request for proposals or information, if you will, associated with uh, governance in a day two market uh, to be looking at that. And I think the, the, but the most important aspect that I really like about the, the concept here, and I've talked to BPA about it as well, is that we've got a PMA, a, par, you know, a power marketing agency wrapped around, which for public power uh, is in the Bonneville area and in the Mountain West with Western Area Power Administration is very important to have that anchor. So um, I think that they've got, uh, you know, an interesting uh, proposal on the table uh, and we'll have to, you know, uh, move it along. But I think they're going to be moving it at the same rate or if not as the ISO. So as I say, I think we see it more as a comparative concept. Uh, for instance, I know that the Cal ISO was one of those to respond to the RFI. Uh, associated with that. But if the ISO ran here, would it be the same governance as is here? You see, I mean, those that bring in, so it gives us that contrast to look at, it. versus PJM that came in and made a proposal to Mountain West entirely. You know, I mean, in, in my neck of the woods, PJM is like the Antichrist, right? We don't want to have, um, we don't want that market here. And, uh, but to have them come in and do a very competitive uh, presentation to that, uh, and that was very interesting to see how they're evolving as well. So I think, I think we'll get a good flavor for how all this shakes out. Okay. How are we doing on time, Tom? Uh, okay. Uh, anybody, anything you want to get off your chest or share with the audience or uh, uh, last words on the topic? PGM's the Antichrist, what's California? Yeah. <laughs> uh, well, it's the uh, potential, uh, you know, good witch of the West. Right? <laughs> uh, well, uh, I think I first heard the word uh, Californication from someone from Montana when uh, I was not yet a Californian, but... Uh, uh, I think it, it is a, a real concern. I, it was kind of brought home to me when I was talking with uh, Bryce Freeman, the consumer advocate from Wyoming, and he pointed out that uh, the entire population of his state would fit comfortably within the city of San Francisco. <laughs> that it, uh, it gives you a sense of magnitude and... Uh, so we, we've got some real challenges here, but uh, I, I think it sounds pretty uh, encouraging how far we've come in the last couple of years. So uh, 
everyone thank the panelists and I'd like to keep everyone up here for a moment. <laughs>